I fell in love with it. As soon as I stood up, I was hooked. When I got to my feet, I was hooked. I really can't explain it. It's just a magnet that when my brother introduced me, it hit. It's almost like my yoga, my meditation, my gym, my family. It's everything to me. That feeling you get from going surfing, what is that fever? What is that bug? It's just that rush of trying something new, of just trying something, of moving. There's a certain buzz or feel that you get from that exercise or that feeling is irreplaceable. There's a wildness there, there's a freedom there that I don't experience on the land. Some of us are just bound by it and it's our happiness and it's our soul. Nobody's there because they have to be. Everybody serves because they want to be. It'll ruin your life or make it the best thing ever at the same time. Now there are so many people surfing that they don't have a sense of history of surfing. I think the lack of the history, if people don't understand it, there's a whole lot more to it than just going out and riding away. They don't get the whole feel for it. They won't get the whole appreciation. Our tradition goes back to the Hawaiians. So we have a Hawaiian pedigree. Who knows when the first time was, but we go back to the early 20th century when a group of Hawaiian princes came into Northern California. Apparently that was the first. But then we had a succession of people usually coming here, people of note that were Hawaiian, that were lifeguards and would put on demonstration. Considered at the time to be Hawaii's best surfer, after teaching writer Jack London to surf in Waikiki, George Freeth embarks on his journey to the mainland. He goes on to establish coastal lifeguarding programs in both Venice and Redondo Beach. During a violent storm, George Freeth dives from the Venice Beach Pier to rescue seven men from a sinking fishing boat single-handedly. Newspapers worldwide would memorialize his bravery. The newly formed Amateur Athletics Union considered lifeguarding a profession. Unjustly, George Freeth was disqualified from competing on the 1912 Olympic swimming and diving team. In 1915, San Diego celebrates the opening of the Panama Canal with the Panama California Exposition. George Freeth relocates to San Diego and takes a job lifeguarding at John D. Spreckel's tent city on Coronado. During a heat wave on May 5, 1918, over 60 swimmers are swept out to sea by the strong rip currents and unusually high surf. Thirteen people, mostly World War I soldiers stationed here in San Diego, would lose their lives in what is still considered the worst mass casualty drowning in American history. Enlisting the help of famous lifeguard George Freeth, San Diego establishes the first municipally funded lifeguarding program in the state. During the First World War, housing shortages in San Diego forced members of the military returning from deployment in Europe into very close and crowded living quarters. As a result, San Diego was one of the region's hardest hit by the pandemic. Though records were not kept, it is estimated that as many as 60 million souls were lost worldwide. I would rather be ashes than dust. I would rather that my spark should burn out in a brilliant blaze than it should be stifled by dry rot. I would rather be a superb meteor, every atom of me in magnificent glow, than a sleepy and permanent planet. The function of man is to live, not to exist. I shall not waste my days trying to prolong them. I shall use my time. Jack London. Back in the early 1900s, Duke Hanamoko bringing surfing to the world. He was a world-class Olympic swimmer, and when he went places to do swimming exhibitions, take a surfboard out, you know, in California, on the East Coast, 
in Europe, in France, in Australia, and introduced riding the surfboard to people. That whole history, when people start surfing, I don't think they even consider the history. I don't think they think about the background going all the way back to the Duke and, and his spirit. One of the original Mission Beach lifeguards, Charlie Wright, learns to surf from Duke Kahatamoku following the 1924 Olympics. Charlie teaches a very bold Faye Baird Frazier to surf, seen here rocking a one-piece swimsuit. In 1924, the duo will garner national attention with a torchlight surfing exhibition celebrating the opening of the new Crystal Pier and Ballroom in Pacific Beach. M.L. Sigler was the first lifeguard to use the dory to tow Charlie's surfboard, nicknamed Iron Tip, up to Pacific Beach Point on good days. M.L. was a waterman, a character, and a true surf legend. Following a dramatic rescue at Newport Beach, captured in the Los Angeles Times, Duke's use of the surfboard as a rescue device made headlines worldwide. Tom Blake creates and patents a hollow surfboard based on sailboat hull design. Cigar boxes, though not rugged enough for everyday surfing, were best suited for life-saving. Coot boxes, as they would become known, were quickly deployed by lifeguards along shorelines worldwide, replacing the rescued dory. The beach was inexpensive recreation in the post-depression era. Californians overwhelmingly supported bonds for coastal preservation and California began acquiring coastal land that would protect our beautiful beaches for the generations that would come. Don Oki became a fixture in Tourmaline Canyon and specifically the point where he built the first surf shack. Oki would go on to build the historic landmark Palapa Shack at Winden Sea. Surf legend Dorian Doc Paskowitz served as a Mission Beach lifeguard for years. Paskowitz is best remembered for walking away from his successful medical practice in order to raise his nine children surfing out of an RV. An iconic legend, Woody Ekstrom, is credited as the first to surf wind and sea. My brother and sister and I uh, basically grew up on Voltaire Street in Ocean Beach. A lot of nicknames in my family. My sister was Dolly, my brother was Skeeter, my dad was Red, my mom was Snooks, and then I got the name Scooter when I was in high school from playing football. Sometime in the 30s, my brother Skeeter took up surfing. Uh, the only guys I knew of were my brother and the guys that he, he was surfing with in those days. Kimball Don was one of his best buddies, Bill Sales, uh, Hadji Hine, and Lloyd Baker. He would take me over here to PB Point before the, you know, the war. And I would sit up on the cliff there and watch him. I vaguely remember that because I was really small. I think I started around 42 or 43. He made a board for me. When Skeeter made my first board, he made a little cart for it. And uh, I think I was only about nine years old. And I took it down to OB and I tried it and it scared me. A, a couple of guys on the beach, uh, Jim Mouse Rob and a, a guy by the name of Bob Feger were watching me and they came over and asked if they could try the board. I thought, yeah, that, that'd be neat. I'd like to have a couple of guys. And so we, we started together. It probably took a good, oh, 10 years because it was on and off. It wasn't every day like I do now. I started at OB and then went to the cliffs and then i used to go up to del mar my brother a lifeguard when the old pier was there learned how to surf off of there too and so it it took uh oh gosh a good 10 years i would say i ask that the congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by japan on sunday 
December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. These Japanese bombers may not be expected here tonight or tomorrow, but our military authorities have told us they will strike and when least expected. How well prepared is your town? There was active concern about a Japanese invasion in Southern California and at La Jolla Shores was restricted. At times you couldn't go there because they were afraid that there was going to be a landing. Hard to think that, that we were afraid of that and that there were searchlights and everything uh, down there to, to protect it. Off of PB Point was a restricted area. They were practicing firing major artillery at targets that were being dragged through the air. Reverberation to those actually caused cracks in the plaster in our home and other ones. You didn't complain about a crack in the window because it was wartime. Victory flash electrified Times Square, keyed to the bursting point as the magic word of complete surrender came through. Some exploding emotion. Thus did DJ Day go into history. Servicemen are coming back from the islands. They're experiencing a different culture. My family was in the Navy, so we kept going back and forth from uh, Hawaii, you know, about three times. They're bringing back elements of Hawaiian dress, uh, Hawaiian language. And this is catching on in Southern California. All the action was in La Jolla. The actual surfers were kind of like World War II guys. Some were still in their 20s. It was a different crowd and a different crew, and a lot of them were loners, you know, and they were kind of hard to get to know, but they just seemed like men. My first ride in surfing was on what's called a paddleboard, 12-foot board, straight sides, you can't turn it. You go out and stand on a reef at the cove, and when the wave comes by, you just shove off, climb on the board, stand up, and go straight into you, run into the beach. At the age 10, I still wasn't interested in surfboards because they were too heavy. I was just a skinny little kid. I had a 12-foot board, 95 pounds, and, and, and other people didn't want to try that. But then when I saw, I'm pretty sure it was Bob Simmons, pick up a balsa surfboard at Wind and Sea with one, one arm, I went, oh, okay, you know, that's, that's, that's for me. I, I, can, I can do this after all. That opened up for a lot of young people, teenagers. In 1955, I made my first surfboard out of uh, balsa wood wrapped. They were from World War II, and they were chunks of balsa wood. I soaked it in water to get the pieces loose from, from, the, from the board, and I glued the pieces back together into a surfboard shape. I had help with an old-timer by the name of Dick Swartz. He, he was a boat builder and a, and a tuna fisherman and a real ocean-going guy. I couldn't get my hands on any fiberglass, and we borrowed uh, Dick Schwartz's U.S. Navy solid gray <laughs> woody, and we drove up to Manhattan Beach, and I bought some fiberglass and resin from uh, from Dale Velsey. He was the only guy that, that had anything going at that time. Began surfing in the end of the balsa era, which was from roughly 1950 to 1960. So 58 was still pretty 
pretty much all balsa wood boards. One day I was uh, riding my bike down in PB somewhere. I looked over the right and there was two guys in the garage and there was a surfboard in there. There was Larry Gordon and Floyd Smith. I knew during high school. Story goes that we have the Malibu guys to thank it was in the 50s. Somebody had an idea like, man, I'm tired of getting out of the sand and dragging my longboard down to the beach or my girlfriend to ride it. Let's make some thin, smaller, light surfboards. So they made these boards called the girlfriend boards. And the girls could take them out and surf on them, carry them and handle them. So one day the guys thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to take out their boards? Ha ha ha. Well, the joke was on them. They started surfing and realized how much better they could surf, more maneuverable and fun. And then that kind of started the lighter, smaller, thinner, tuned in boards of the mid 50s. What happened was the boards got shorter. They got away from the heavy redwood balsa pine and they went to styrofoam boards. The new foam blanks came out and, and it really just boomed. Suddenly you have a newly engineered surfboard. You have lighter materials, a hit book that becomes a movie. And overnight, the number of people getting into the water is just amazing. It's been wonderful over the years uh, with the democratization of the boards, more people now have access to, to surfing. Yeah, I think surfing has accepted women into it probably more than other mainstream sports. It was a funny story, too. I was surfing Swamis, and uh, Linda Benson, she was this cute little blonde, and I, I went, wow, girl surfing, you know, and she was good. And she lost her board, man. I ran across the reef to get her board. Wah! You know, like, but she's the first one I ever saw. It's a melting pot for everybody. It doesn't matter, you know, race, color, creed, gender. You know, everybody deserves to be out there. It's one of the great things about it, breaks down barriers. You have all ethnicities down there in the canyon. All they are is surfers. You don't think about them being black or white or brown or yellow or whatever, you know? San Diego is the naval town. The Navy was uh, greatly supported. A lot of the military people that were here at the time had no concept of the, the mentality. They didn't understand it at all. And so there was a bit of a rift there, yeah. Yeah, surfers were, were you know, bums or something like that. No one really knew what to make of it because they were just free spirits enjoying life, enjoying the ocean. So they would get into a little trouble, like to have a lot of fun. So it was frowned upon. We lived on the beach. We, you know, had parties there. And, you know, every time we'd go somewhere, we always come back. Five o'clock in the morning, I'd be down there at sunrise, you know, checking it out, seeing what the day was. So it suddenly became part of our life, you know. So we're just breathing this stuff. Billy Hamilton, Skip Fry, you know, we were all accomplished surfers. And when we went to a surf spot, we all had the same board on the car. And it was really looked cool. We were all red fans and the same board. You know, the people didn't like it that we were there um, parking in front of their houses. Our cars weren't nice, and we were probably changing in front of their houses. You're a surfer, you're a beach bum. That means you would rather be at the beach than working, which was quite true in a lot of cases. <laughs> My dad was kind of a beatnik. He did have bongos that he played at the beach and ukuleles, and we had beach parties. Yeah, we were just a bunch of kids, and we laughed and we made noise, and we probably uh, weren't the best thing for the neighborhood. There was a sports commentator, Al Coupe, and when the Windesee Surf Club won the first Malibu Invitational, at the end of his commentary, he said, it's too bad these guys don't learn how to keep their pants on, quit urinating in public, and just become members of the human race. That was the start of, wait a minute, we got a public image to, to try to change. Public image of surfers when I started surfing was, was uh, not very good. 
As a matter of fact, my uh, parents were very much against uh, surfing. Uh, they banned me from surfing several times, uh, not only because I made a surfboard and made a mess in my mom's laundry room, but also, you know, they were considered um, kind of a bunch of hoodlums. In 1958, Pacific Beach Point, the former anti-aircraft installation, was being marketed and sold as the Sun Gold Point Estates. The conflict had begun immediately following the development of Pacific Beach Point, and by 1961, communist rhetoric vilifying the youth and targeting surfers was being used to stoke political fears to control the community and privatize San Diego beaches. Ironically, when speaking of surfers, it was Schlack that was quoted in the San Diego Union saying, when surfers feel that everything belongs to them, they're playing the communist role. Property owners were convinced that surfers were bringing down the value of their $25,000 homes, and the homeowners were determined to keep the public off their private beaches. These weren't felons, these weren't thugs, these weren't, you know, vandals. Well, they were the vandals, but that's just the name they got after <laughs> Because at the time, the surfing image was surfers go to the beach, they tear down your fence, they burn this firewood, they change in the street, they flash your daughters. The people that were really hard were surfers that lived there and walked to the beach every day. We didn't really hang at the beach, per se. We, we went up, went surfing, and then went home. A lot of the people were what we call hodads from inland that would drive to the beach for the day and their parents would drop them off so they were a captive audience until the sun went down. It wasn't their neighborhood. They didn't care what took place. So that was what was giving surfers a bad image. So there was a lot of ways different cities along the Southern California coast were dealing with the surfing population explosion. We started hearing about Los Angeles having a black ball, like Huntington Beach. They'd put a flag up, you can't surf. Newport Beach and Huntington, they were making people license their boards. You couldn't use the ocean without a license on your board. As surfing started growing and populations started getting bigger, it started being a problem with wanting more swimming areas. How are we going to keep the public away from the surfboards? Because the public is clueless. They're barely, you know, they've come out from Iowa, they're in the water for the first time in their life, and here comes four. 30-pound surfboards at them. They have no clue what's going on. The surfers got moved north of Crystal Pier, but it caused friction with people that lived there. They wanted the surfers out. Uh, they would take pictures of surfers changing. They would make up stories, some of them may be true, to try to get rid of surfing. Up at the point in the early days, the neighbors all had the streets painted red so you couldn't park up there. Well, ultimately, there was an event where a kid that lived in the neighborhood at PV Point threw a rock and broke a window. So the person that was making the most noise, anti-surfing, used that to get Pacific Beach Point shut down. You couldn't surf there. If you paddled from Hawaii, you couldn't surf there. If you got dropped in by a helicopter, you couldn't surf there. You just couldn't surf Pacific Beach Point. He had a guy named Bob Cosgrove. He was a real diligent lieutenant of the lifeguard service, although he did have a younger brother that was a fantastic surfer and still a great surfer 50 years later. He was the one that made it his mission to go underneath Crystal Pier and go north of the pier and catch surfers surfing the point when it was closed down. He would actually get out and chase people down on the rocks. They'd try to run out in the water to hide from him and try to wait him out, but he'd write tickets. He was so good at it, and could look out and just by looking at the surfboards, knew who was out in the water. I remember one night, it was at, at dark, and uh, a couple of us were out, and then they were, they were on us, man. Come in. Uh-oh. It got darker and darker, and I went way out, and I paddled down the Mission Beach and came in and escaped. I ran away that time, so I beat a repeat offender. <laughs> I don't know. I remember I, I didn't want to go in and... At 11 o'clock in the morning, the flag went up, you had to get out of the water, and they would take it down at 6 p.m., and you could surf after 6. The first couple seasons of that being enacted caused a lot of friction between the surfers and the lifeguards because we'd be standing there at 5.15, 
Nobody would be in the water. Sometimes we'd watch for hours from Crystal Pier up to Law Street. There would be somebody maybe wading in the ankle deep water, you know, looking for sand crabs, but we couldn't surf. At this point in time, there was a real um, problem between surfers and lifeguards. And uh, the lifeguards were constantly battling the surfers and trying to hem them in to uh, control the spaces. You didn't want to have the surfers and the swimmers in the same area, and we understood that. But uh, the lifeguards kind of took it to a, a higher degree. You had some pretty heavy lifeguards, you know, like Bob Shea. You didn't mess with him, man. I mean, he just, you know, you <laughs> he, he was like hardcore. Crystal Pier was a noted one where they had changed things a lot. They had rules, no surfing near the pier. And then if you get too close to the pier, too, you got to surf 100 feet away from the pier, which is beyond the peak, I think. So up went a sign, I think it was 75 yards from the pier, which held about as much power in the water as near the pier. And so that meant you could take off right on top of the pier. And I wasn't near it, I was kind of close, but I wasn't near it. And they'd paddle out, and if you were on the wrong side of the line, they'd tell you to go in and they'd write you a ticket. But it seemed like it was a, a put on attitude, like, hey, I'm the lifeguard, you're the kid, you just do what I tell you to do. Those are rules, but they don't affect us, because we're surfers. Uh, a couple times I got caught, and a couple times I got away. And so my interaction with the, with the lifeguards always was an you know, antagonistic type situation. San Diego's idea at the time was, we'll take Thermaline Canyon, make that a surf park, give it to them, and they'll keep them quiet. They can surf there, and we'll have the rest of the, the beaches, you know, for tourism or swimmers or whatever. We didn't think that much of the canyon anyhow. I mean, at least Henson and I did. Well, nobody surfed it. I mean, now I think it's one of the greatest places there is, you know. There was no road. It was just a dirt field all behind Mission Boulevard to Termaline. So the surfers that lived around there and wanted to surf PB Point would say, why can't we just walk down to PB Point through Termaline? The city had been making a deal with these developers. And I think as an afterthought, they went, oh, we're going to give it to the surfers. They put, put out they were going to do a surf park. And, you know, we didn't know what surf park meant, you know, but they were going to do something to the place. So rumor came on and, and everybody kind of, you know, we were, we were uh, against it, we, you know, told people, or, you know, we didn't get too into it, but... We got, no thanks. We just want to walk down the goat trail and go surf the point. Well, I ran around with Mike Henson a lot, so uh, we kind of worked off each other quite a bit. When they made the canyon, I, Henson and I weren't too stoked because we didn't even think waves broke there, you know, with, because we never surfed there that much. You know, it was actually a lot better than, than what we had in our minds, you know. When I came back from Hawaii one time, they had already grounded, you know, taken all the bushes out. And I was just absolutely astounded and amazed of what they were doing. And, and um, you had all these, uh, you know, these little ropes, a uh, uh, string, you know, to measure stuff like this. And so I just kind of got into it and I went down and I just started, you know, vandalizing the place, you know. I hit it pull some stuff up, leave, you know, and then come back, you know, and try to get someone to come with me, you know, not, not too many people would go with me. But um, I just wanted to stop it, you know. I remember jumping into a tractor around it like this, and it kind of popped it in gear, and the thing started rolling. I jumped off, <laughs> it rolled a little ways, you know. Uh, I was gone by the time it, where, wherever it ended up. <laughs> yeah, once it became known that the motive of the city was to ultimately pat themselves on the back and say, look what the city of San Diego has done. We give the surfers their own park. So their whole concept was to put them in a package at Tourmaline. They could have Tourmaline Park. Look, it's, it's down there. We could fortify the thing on the walls if we wanted, you know, if you really got down to it. It was a way of containing the surfers. Their motive was to put us there and have no surfing anywhere else at the beaches. We envisioned 
Termaline Canyon with lifeguards on the north and south side of the thing, like guard towers, watching the surfer, you know, making sure we were kept under uh, control. It was made into a surf park to get rid of the surfers. It was a place to do away with the surf. Hey, if we have a park, they can go there. And that gets them off the beaches, which, you know, didn't work. <laughs> didn't work at all. It just, it just made a place they could go get a shower. No one really cared about surfing Terminal Canyon, per se. So surfers started protesting the donation of Terminal Canyon, making that our surf spot. There was a lot of a, a protest. They, they got the, uh, the old crew of guys. The guys are like 20, 21 that had their own businesses, like Larry Gordon and Billy Castor. Mike Hinson, people like that, to kind of stand up and, and speak for the surfers. But the surfers didn't have that much credibility until a man named Tor Stinson, who was a public relations man, stepped into the scene and uh, started organizing the surfers and finding a way to give surfers a voice. He kind of, we had this Windsor Surf Club started, so he kind of got involved, he was real executive. He was handling all this downtown stuff, getting um, permits for stuff, you know, and all that. The city council go, well, how do we know you represent surfers? Who, who are you guys? You, you guys aren't anybody. You're just teenage kids and whatever. Of course, Floyd and Larry had a surfboard business, but that didn't hold too much water back then in the early 60s. It got to a point where the, uh, you know, what's the criteria? What the hell are we doing out here? How do you win? What do you do to win, you know? So Tor, being a smart public relations man started developing the Windsor Surf Club and getting people like Phil Edwards, who's known as the best surfer in the world, Hobie Alter, who was a, a, a large surfboard manufacturer, Joey Cabell, who started the Chart House restaurants, uh, a number of people that had all had won surf contests around the world, so that the next time that they went to the city council and say, we represent the surfers, they go, what, what, what surfers? Well, he could name off 10 or 20 of the world's greatest surfers. So I think that's what motivated the likes of Mike Hinson and Mike Diffenderfer to join the cause along with the other adult surfers at the time, which, you know, young 20 guys. So it was the youth that was really kind of involved in trying to keep us from being stuck at Turnley for an ultimate surf experience for the rest of our lives. And the surfers would continually work towards those issues that they wanted in a non-violent way, but they would just keep transgressing. You know, you can't walk across the beach with your surfboard here. Probably you're gonna get the guys, half of them are gonna walk across the beach right there. And what are you gonna do? You gonna throw them in jail for walking across the beach? 50s and 60s people coming up that wanted to break away from authority. You know. Fear authority, hate authority, you break down authority, anti-establishment, whatever it was. And the surfers kind of were the peak of that. They would do it at a personal, local level. They were rebellious. It was a constant kind of a battle, I, I know at least with my parents, uh, whether they'd let me do it or not let me do it. In the end, they finally determined that uh, it was pretty much harmless. But the big thing was the Terminal Canyon and the inauguration, I guess, you know, and me cutting the ribbon, which was kind of classic at the time. In the early 1960s, while surfers defended their line in the sand, it was San Diego Parks and Recreation Supervisor Les Ernest and City Manager Tom Fletcher who nobly took on the status quo. The powerful, influential real estate developers profiting hand over fist with runaway development of San Diego. Les Ernest boldly outlined the need for parks to open space for every San Diegan, declaring that if the city failed to act, the only recreation areas for future generations would be amusement parks. He demanded that the city of San Diego take action to protect 12.25 acres of parks and open space for every 1,000 citizens. In a stark contradiction today, citizens of San Diego have been rationed to only 1.25 acres of open space for every 1,000 citizens. Together, Les Ernest and city manager Tom Fletcher envisioned and created Tourmaline Surf Park 
Mission Bay Park and laid the necessary groundwork to preserve what would later become Mission Trails Park, one of the largest municipal parks in the United States. 1966, what they did at PB Point, in lieu of still having Terminal Canyon accessible, was they would paint the curbs red so you couldn't park there. They wouldn't let you walk down to surf there with a surfboard. But an older guy who was a dentist, Dr. Ryan, he was the one day he came walking down while the police were all standing, making sure we weren't taking our surfboards down there. He had his cutoff jeans. He was probably early 30s. Most surfers were in their teens. And the policeman said, excuse me, sir, you can't go down there. He goes, yes, I can. This is a public thoroughfare. This is the end of a, a public street, and I'm accessing the ocean to the public street. Well, ultimately, he talked the cop into writing the ticket. He went and fought it in court, and voila, PB Point was opened at that excess. In 1967, there were people surfing near the pier, and Lieutenant Shea came with his group of guys, they called everybody out of the water, surfing next to the pier. He lined people up according to their surfboard. Well, I wasn't surfing that day. I was going to go to a Big Brother and the Holding Company Jefferson Airplane concert at the concourse. A friend of mine who surfed there every day, his board was sitting there, and what Lieutenant Shea would do would say, okay, whose surfboard is this? The guy would claim it, write him a ticket. So I looked at all the boards lined up, and no one really paid attention to that except for the one by one. I walked over and grabbed my friend Steve Siebold's board. I was going to walk off with it. I was, Wait a minute, that board's impounded. You can't, you can't take it. And I said, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. That's my surfboard, and I have to go somewhere. I was just going to take it. Well, he physically grabbed that on my hand, and as he swung it around, the fin caught me between my leg and kind of jerked me and tugged on him. So I think with his back turned to me, he figured I'd made a violent attack on pulling the board out of his hand when actually it was the way he slung it around and the fin hooked my leg. You're under arrest. He picked me up. You know, I was probably four foot 10. He was six foot four. So picked me up, set me in a lifeguard Jeep and you're under arrest. So I'm sitting there. And while all this is going on, I'm thinking, like, I'm under arrest. I'm 17. I'm at the beach. You know, man, I'm going to miss the concert. Ed Little, big guy, came over and started talking to me. While he was talking to me, Shea came over and said, this person is under arrest. You can't communicate with them. Move away. Of course, Big Eddie goes, I can talk to anybody I want. It's a public beach. So make a long story short, they got in a scrap. While they were on the ground fighting in the sand, flailing around, I looked around, and that was my cue to exit. Up until that point, I'm in junior high or high school, and I'd go to a girl's house, and the dad would say, so, what are you, a surfer? Yeah, uh, that was bad. That was bad. But after a summer of love in 67, oh, you're a surfer. At least you're not one of those hippies. So the hippies movement is kind of what took the monkey off the back of surfing. Tourmaline is a very unique place for a number of reasons, one of them being the geography. It's just overall, the weather, the way it's situated. As far as the surfing community, the, the topography, the way you've got reefs and points and beaches and different angles, so you've got almost any wind angle, you've got protection somewhere. Within 100 yards, you've got a beach break, a point break, although it's not a true point break, and then a, a reef break. So where else are you going to find this unique combination of breaks in such a short distance? And some days it can be firing, and some days it can be mushy, and some days it could be fun and playful, and some days it can be scary. It's the embodiment of a great surf spot. Eventually, Termaline Canyon was built, scraped, made into a big box, asphalt put down there. And no one really used it that much until they started sand reclamation projects. There was a time when we couldn't walk to the beach because trucks were dumping sand from the jetty that they were dredging out and up and dumping it on the beaches. In the early to mid-80s, that sand dumping ultimately filled in sand all the way up from Law Street close to PB Point. Back then it had cobbles, black cobbles. <laughs> didn't have sand. You didn't go there for beach parties so much. The beach breaks weren't that fast. It was well accepted, but nobody changed their lifestyle to go use it until Skeeter came along, I guess, years later. Skeeter would come down to the beach, and everybody knew him, and he knew everybody else. Well, I think the main 
character in Canyon history would be Skeeter Malcolm. You know, the tailgaters, they kind of got that thing. He was the original tailgater. And like after every session, he'd have food or donuts, you know, for anybody and everybody. Skeeter Malcolm was down there every day with Hawaiian music, tailgate down, and donuts. Haji and all those guys, Haji, Goldie, Ron St. John. Ron St. John used to cut up donuts and he could feed, you know, 20 people with three donuts. Black Mac, Bud and Joe, they, they were always the guys that were very mellow and very welcoming. I mean, literally, you walk into the parking lot and they're like, oh, come over to our tailgate and have some, have some donuts and coffee. You know? That's the first thing you walked into when I was a kid when you were there. And now that's not there anymore. Skeeter was the genesis of all of the, uh, uh, the tailgating thing. I had the greatest respect for was Skeeter Malcolm. And he'd been a coach at Point Loma, but he was a great surfer. He was always doing something. He always had Aloha music. He always had something to eat and everybody bringing other stuff in. And he, would, he was the place people went to so that you could surf, have a good time with a bunch of your friends. And then you came out of the water and hung out, you know, until you had to go do whatever you had to do. And that was almost like it was when, when they were younger. And when I was younger, you would do the same thing. It's also a place for people to hang out and skateboard, picnic, get together, and just enjoy each other's company. Through the last uh, 10 years, I've fallen back in love with Tourmaline. They had always had a nice vibe there. There was a very pleasant place to serve. It was a very diverse crowd, a lot of aloha there. Everyone's so kind and nice. It's a great place to go. Uh, weekends, they would put up a sheet. Somebody had a generator to show a surf movie. That group of guys, it really blossomed in the middle 80s into the 90s. Wonderful experiences of Tourmaline with the Aloha spirit. The guys and gals that hung out at Tourmaline were just so nice, and uh, you couldn't help but gravitate towards them. You know, I don't really, uh, I don't know how to phrase it. I'm sorry, I'm so emotional. Those guys, I don't know, they just had an air about them, you know. You just had so much respect for them because they were such, they were gentlemen. Uh, they respected everybody, they, they respected the ocean, they respected everything about the ocean. They respected each other, they, uh, they played by the rules. When Haji, I think he was uh, 95 years old, he had made it a point to um, catch a wave that summer when it was warmer and stand up, and I was there. It was an accomplishment when you think about his age, the strength uh, quotient, and how hard it is for somebody 95 to even get out of bed, to actually catch a wave and push himself up and push his body weight up to stand up and balance on a wave. No, I think I've, I've, <sighs> One of the things I've realized is that I'm I'm very average, and uh, I, I think I've I've probably uh, overachieved <laughs> for my talent and and my ability. I've gotten a lot of recognition, and that's just by being around really good 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 people people like uh, like Larry Gordon. And that's why you see now that uh, the Larry Gordon bench that's going to be put down at Tourmaline is going to be right there next to the Skeeter Malcolm bench that's been there for 25, 30 years. I, I witnessed that tourmaline was when Larry Gordon, who has Parkinson's, made it a point to get in shape, to catch a weight by himself and to stand up. It was emotional to see. I have to tell you that the one who has encouraged me the most um, is Larry Gordon. Skip's been a <clears throat> blessing in my life uh, for just year after year after year. And uh, he's go back a long ways. A lot of ups and, and downs, but uh, 
Skip is probably the most beloved surfer in the world, I think. You know, we learned how to surf there, really, you know. Some guys would come down, they heard about us, you know, Skip and I and a few other people. So they come down and find us, you know, and we take them down to the point. Skip Fry is really a mellow guy. One of the big joys that lots of us would have is we'd go out, get close enough to him, so if he caught the wave, we'd be on the same wave. That's Skip Fry. Oh, I'm surfing with Skip Fry. Wow. And he's out in a real smooth water. And he's just standing there in the Skip Fry way, which is just simple. And he just, he surfs with his ankles. You know, he can change the weight of the board and makes it so smooth. It's, it's just beautiful. Whenever I see Skip, like I'll be sitting on the inside and he'll come out, he'll paddle by me. He, he knows that I shortboard and he always has a little bit of respect for me, it feels like. Because every time he paddles by me, he does like the little motorcycle sound. He's like, rrr, 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 rrr. and I get a kick out of that. Skipper used to paddle from over here in PV somewhere and all the way to the cliffs and surf various breaks all the way and then paddle all the way back. And that, I always thought, wow, that is a real accomplishment. He's just style personified. It's funny, I watch him on land, I watch him in the water. He's, he's, he's soul. They're world champs down at Tourmaline on any given day, and they don't brag about it. They don't say longboarding's better. The next day you might see him out on a fish. Longboarding is just embraced there because of the conditions and the people that are passionate about longboarding. A lot of places I go in California, the, the competition, the aggressiveness is definitely um, felt more than it is in San Diego. There is quite a bit of localism, um, sometimes to the extreme, where you don't necessarily end up having people getting beaten up, but you have surfboards stolen, you have cars wrecked, you have, you know, dumb stuff like that happen. Whereas here, yeah, you might get yelled at and you might get, you know, like a crooked look and somebody might give you some static, but really in essence, that's the extent of it. To some degree, I think people bring their attitude. They bring their attitude from their workplace or bring their attitude from their home place and then they insert it in the lineup. And it should be the other way. They should leave their background or they should leave their income stream they should leave you know their home situation and all of a sudden they get melded into a community of surfers who who all kind of gravitate to appreciating the ocean embrace more the basics of the culture which is hey let's do let's have some fun let's get people together let's enjoy each other let's go back to the olden ways of having 10 people take off in the same wave and smile and laugh and jump from board to board because when i started surfing internally we would still do that from young to old i mean down at the canyon we have people that are in their late 80s they surf every day we have people that are two three and four years old and they are out there surfing you look anywhere, and what do, you, what do you do when you go to the beach? You have to pay for parking. You go down to Tremblin Canyon, there's no parking lot meters or pay, pay parking. It's one of the one places in California you can go to and not have to pay to park. My parents were adamant against it and didn't want to block access to the beaches. We did petitioning as a little kid. I remember just walking, you know, all around PB. And my parents, um, my grandparents, all of us, we were very active in... Uh, keeping coastal access prime for, for the citizens. We got to be able to have access to our beaches. There's, there's no reason why we shouldn't. They had to fight all the time, all the surfers up and down the coast. The ocean should be accessed by anyone. There should be nobody telling you, you can't surf, you can't swim. There has to be access. You can't dominate access to the coast. Honestly, the landline should be public access anywhere, all up and down the coast. I don't think that they should be privatizing beaches whatsoever for anyone. It's wrong. <laughs> the beaches in the ocean are for us. I think the history of San Diego, as I've seen it, has been increased access to the resource. All the beaches have their own little flavor, but tourmaline has a soul. And the surfers that started that beach were always the soulful people. 
They didn't have the best break. They're down there in their canyon and the storm drain comes over there and, and all the flotsam and jetsam in the world washes up there and stank bank is there and all those things are there. But it's the soul of tourmaline that makes that the, the really sacred and special place. Tourmaline has always done that for me. I've always been able to, to get out there and, and, and have fun and get some turns in. These guys were guys that kind of made the paths for us to surf. So those guys kind of demonstrated a better balanced life. Meeting at Tourmaline in the, in the 80s and, and on up really gave a better uh, structure to the young surfers coming up to realize that uh, there was more life than just surfing, but you could enhance that surfing life by, you know, getting a good education, getting a good job, taking care of your families and, and still have surf time. Yeah, it'd be great if uh, surfers could all just sort of get along, share a wave. There's plenty of them out there. One of the big, the big joys is uh, in looking back at, at a number of rides that I've had with friends of mine. And you can be going on and you can be talking and you can be cutting back and forth. And, and you want your friend to have as good a ride as you have. And as a matter of fact, the Aloha Spirit is if two of you are at the peak, and for some reason uh, you want the other person to have a good ride, you pull out and let them take it. You give them the wave. Just because your, your buddies are all together, and, and it's the Aloha sense that we're all sharing this marvelous natural experience together, and we're all part of the universe. And it's in that sense, it's a kind of spiritual. That flourished at Termaline because that was a good meeting place for those old guys. They could drive down to the beach, park their car, easy access. Some of them, you know, had a hard time getting in and out, but they would go in and out of the water every day by clockwork. So that Termaline Canyon kind of bridged that gap for me because that was where the old, 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 and the kind of old and the new sort of met all at once in that park, which was really a soulful thing. Tourmaline Surf Canyon has a built-in um, aloha, just through the generations of all those legends before us. Um, the, the type of surfer that goes there, that visits there, the type of surf break that it is, I don't think the Oahu will probably ever disappear from that surf break. Our jobs are hard. Our days are long. Our worries and our concerns are many. Our relationships are strained. Ah, but on that day, when I'm, I can move away temporarily, and I can go to the beach, I can get my board, you think about what you do. You start, as the closer you get to the beach, you start removing clothing. You're unburdening yourself, and then you're stuck to the land, but then you get to this margin, this, uh, this uh, liminal space, and, and suddenly you leave the safety of the land and you push off into the uncertainty of the water. And as you move farther and farther away, all those things that burden us on land just kind of dissipate. And if it's a big day, then your concentration really has to focus. I can't think about that bill that I have to pay. I can't think about that report. I've got a 12-foot macker about ready to crash down on me here. You are literally in the moment, and oftentimes your survival depends upon it. That's such a beautiful thing because most of us don't live in the moment. We have this shore-based existence that really weighs us down, but you get out in the water, there's a wildness there, there's a freedom there that I don't experience on the land. Just thinking about surfing, and I'm gonna be honest right now, I'm going surfing after here. I'm kind of thinking, okay, you know, let's get going here. I gotta get in the water because I need that outlet for me. I think it's a wonderful story of democracy. Not in the political sense, although there's a political element to it, but just in uh, making a resource accessible to all, regardless of age, regardless of social class, uh, regardless of sex, regardless of ethnicity, and it's, it's beautiful. For a surfing place, it's one of the best in the world, man. It's just 
It's a world-class place. America's finest city. Yes, it is. Send the check to Skip Fry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, there's a there's a peak, and that's where most of the people that know what they're doing go, is the peak of the wave to get the best waves. So when somebody's learning, it's so much better if they go away from the crowd so that if they do make a, you know, let their board go, they're not going to hit hit people and hurt people, you know? That's good. People need to go away from the rest of the crowd. I'm, I'm thinking like East crowd. Coast. <laughs> <laughs> East Coast is a good place for that. <laughs> no.